recorded. So uh, yes, today I'm going to be presenting a sort of updated version uh, and summary of uh, my book. Updated because, as, as uh, Anna mentioned, it's from 2006 and then translated into French in 2011. So I've I've added some reflections um, post uh, curing the colonizers here. But the gist is the same, which is to say that I want to examine in detail the network, the curative regimes, and the business of French colonial hydrotherapy, uh, what I boldly call the only empire, modern empire, of, that rested on spas, uh, very much inspired, by the way, from ancient Rome, right? There's all of the illusions that run through French colonial history of a Pax Gallica, of recreating uh, 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 the, the, even the, the contours of the Roman Empire in North Africa, that rhetoric uh, runs through the French uh, colonial spa as well. So um, you'll see that I'm not exactly a king of the PowerPoint, but this is the summary of what I'd like to do today. I wanna to begin very briefly with the logic of French colonial hydrotherapy before moving on to the intricate uh, system of furloughs that began to be developed in the 1830s and was refined really by the late 1930, 20th century. Uh, then I want to examine several cases, uh, the case of Guadeloupe in the French Caribbean, Bourbon, which uh, after 1848 was renamed Réunion Island in the Indian Ocean, um, the spa at Antirah Bay in Madagascar, uh, before turning to some new material from uh, French colonial Algeria, then uh, Corbus in Tunisia, and then finally several spas in France, which catered uh, to returning colonials uh, after their colonial stay. And then finally, a few thoughts on post-colonial afterlives, which is what is, what is left of this uh, long history of French colonial hydrotherapy, uh, if uh, anything. So I'll begin with this vignette, um, which is an ad from 1924. And uh, it was in a, a magazine that was very widely circulated in French colonial Algeria. And you can see my translation here. Um, you can't take it anymore. The African climate is sapping you slowly. You need to reinvigorate. Il faut vous retremper. I did my best with that. Uh, go to, not God, go to Vichy. Against the poison of Africa, there is but one remedy, Vichy. So here you have it very clearly articulated, this association of salvation for colonials equals Vichy. Elsewhere, it is, um, it is articulated as a syllogism, which is to say, liver pro colony equals liver problems, liver problems equals Vichy. So this kind of very direct connection of if you're sick from the colonies, you must go to Vichy is being articulated here. Now, there's many dimensions to this. One is obviously commercial. This is from that same 1924 magazine. Um, here you have a woman uh, reading, writing rather a letter to quote her good Algerian friends, inviting them to take the waters at Vichy. Lots of things going on here. For one thing, there's a gender dimension. You can see in the background top right, there is a minaret, uh, but she is also uh, uh, above bottom left, the casino at Vichy. And she is wearing a sort of vaguely uh, traditional costume, which might be intended to evoke uh, the water attendants who uh, gave the water glasses to those uh, coming to Vichy. So a, a lot happening in this one image. The basic point that I want to start off with, though, is this incredible, uh, incredibly strong uh, linkage across the medical literature uh, between uh, the colonies and taking the waters at Vichy. And I'll give you three, uh, what I think are representative examples from the 1920s here. The first is from a, a manual. Um, and it's really unique. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy myself, um, but there's many copies bouncing around European libraries. It's called Le Brevier Thermal des Coloniaux. And it is a kind of Bible for colonials wanting to take the waters. It tells them exactly where they can go, whether they are in New Caledonia or uh, actually in another part of Europe or in uh, France, mainland France. So here's a quote from it. Um, a man who has spent much time in the intertropical zone can be compared to an old boat that has been through a lot. After his return from distant campaigns, even though his hull might look just fine at first, he has to be taken to a special basin to undergo a careful review and visit. The same holds for the colonial. Examine him carefully and you'll find a slightly deficient liver, fermenting intestine, or some degree of anemia. In other words, the colonies are a kind of poison. And um, you can, you know, you, you can look fine returning from the colonies, but trust, trust them 
there is something wrong with you. And uh, that, that something wrong with you, of course, is uh, best treated at uh, Vichy. So this idea of uh, the colonies as inherently dangerous is, of course, nothing new. Um, I won't trace sort of, you know, attitudes to the tropics from the Enlightenment on, but obviously this is a, this is a burgeoning field. But I want to suggest that the 19th century marked a kind of apogee of fears, not just of climate, but that the, the colonies and the intertropical zone would cause outright degeneration within a single generation. And that Vichy and the, the spa uh, system was key to try to counter these effects. Now, part of this has to do with, you know, the mysteries surrounding uh, uh, malaria in the 19th century, right? With the, uh, the vector of malaria only really being resolved at the very end of the 19th century with Sir Ronald Ross's discovery of, of the, the mosquito vector. But uh, this suggests, of course, that um, these attitudes take time to change and that the association of healthful waters and the idea of trying to uh, reinvigorate colonials lasts well into the 20th century. Really, what I'm talking about today endures until 1962 and only ends because of the end of formal empire, not because of medical breakthroughs suggesting that the cure effect, curative effects of waters uh, are limited. So here's the next quote. Um, it's by Dr. Alki in the Missionary Bulletin of Vichy. A Vichy cure is the treatment par excellence for malaria. First, first of all, rest and return to France are necessary. One must modify the humoral system through the hydromineral complex, and that is when one should go to Vichy. The cure at Vichy works through a complex mechanism, a sito cleansing, or literally a laundering of our organs or humors, uh, rendered possible by the isotomy of Vichy's waters. Here's another trait, which is to say, the, the curative logic at Vichy is ever changing. Uh, a few, a decade later, it would be uh, the radiation of the waters that would be invoked. Uh, but it's, uh, quote, sovereignty over colonial diseases is a constant. Really, the, the first reference that I found to uh, Vichy being good for malarial fevers dates back to Louis XIV. So this, this is a very old enduring trait. But I want to suggest, of course, that, you know, Vichy also treats other things. And that to some extent, um, this is a phenomenon that is tied to the zeitgeist, which is to say several of the spas in France that catered to malarial patients, patients with yellow fever, patients with amoebic dysentery, have reinvented themselves today as beauty spas or as spas to treat traffic accidents or obesity. And so it's hardly surprising that in the age of empire, a, a series of spas would come to specialize in colonial ailments. The last quote uh, is uh, uh, from uh, another doc, Dr. Glenard, um, from 1927. Amongst malarial patients, even those who have carried the disease for some time, even a short hydromineral treatment can bring out bouts of fever in the form of crise dermale. Quinine tends to alleviate them. Often they then disappear for good. This same temporarily re re reactivation uh, of, a, uh, of a cure at Vichy can be turned to very good use in the case of latent nagging dysenteries. Amoebae tend to reappear through hydrotherapy and the judicious use of the drug amiotine brings a complete and definitive cure. So what's going on here is that Vichy waters are being used in conjunction with a number of other therapies uh, and that the idea is that somehow the waters are going to bring out uh, these latent fevers and they can then be slain uh, by a series of drugs. Now, um, lest you should uh, doubt me, this is some new material that I found in the last five years. Uh, one of the things I could not do very efficiently in the 1990s and early 2000s was look through uh, the individual files of individual colonial officials, uh, because a lot of those files were still closed, or at least the medical uh, uh, contents of those files were closed. And since then, in the last five years, I've actually been able to see um, several such uh, uh, random almost uh, colonial files. And I would suggest that nine out of 10 colonial officials have, just from my sampling, have uh, uh, documents like this in their files. So um, this is from the French colonial archives in Aix-en-Provence. Every French colonial administrator had such a file uh, over the course of their career. It included everything from their grades in colonial school to uh, their different assignments over the course of their career. And invariably you have uh, them taking a, an interruption or a break to go take the waters. And these certificates that you see here are for a, a man by the name of Robert Gary, who was posted in uh, French colonial Cambodia, so in Southeast Asia. Uh, the one on the left is from 1935 and recommends that he takes the waters at Vichy because of, quote, 
a slight hepatic congestion, and flare-ups of malaria after more than three years consecutively spent in Cambodia. Uh, then, uh, almost exactly four years later, you have another letter recommending, another doctor's note recommending that the same colonial official this time take the waters at Châtel Guyon because of, quote, liver insuff insufficiency and gastrointestinal troubles resulting from a long colonial stay. So several things uh, come up here. One is the idea that your colonial career would be punctuated by returns to uh, a spa. And for some colonials who'd spent, you know, 40 years overseas, um, the spa town becomes the point of, of contact with the metropole, the, the, the port of anchoring, literally, for some of these colonials. Another point, of course, is that this is highly uh, uh, organized, and I'll return to the system of furloughs in a second. But one of the arguments that I make in the French version of this book is that this system of furloughs, which is already in place by the late 19th century, in some ways, in some curious ways, anticipates the welfare state. Now, obviously not for everyone, but for uh, uh, colonial uh, administrators. Now, there's lots of other things uh, happening here, but before I, I turn to some other dimensions, here is, a, here is the guide I was talking about. It's from 1928. Uh, and it shows some of the different uh, uh, spas to which um, a colonial is allowed to go. There are a series of spas that by the 1920s have been accredited by the Ministry of the Colonies, and you can see that the list is very impressive. Uh, you'll also see that the length of the recommended cure, which is indicated on the right, is almost universally the same, with a notable exception at the very bottom of Amélie les Bains, which in summer wanted to keep colonials for a staggering 45-day spa. All the others, uh, with again the exception of Bagnard de Luchon, which is a set at 25 days, all the others are listed as 21-day uh, rest periods. So it wasn't uncommon for colonials to go home for their 21-day spa regimen, and from there, uh, go and see cousins, families, uh, relatives, etc. So this was part of a, a of a highly ritualized and highly organized furlough system, where every I would say every four years on the basis of Robert Gary in Cambodia, but it really varied. It depended on the so-called risk of the colonies in one one which was one sorry in which one was posted. So North Africa was considered more healthy than places like uh, French colonial Guyana or uh, French colonial Congo or uh, 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 Cambodia. So it really depended on, on where one was posted. This is what leads me to believe that the French empire was literally uh, in part built on uh, spas. Now there's also a great deal of, of you know, rhetoric around this and propaganda. Um, this poster I use for the French cover of my book, um, it shows uh, Colonel Marchand who famously clashed with the British uh, Kitchener at uh, Fashoda in 1898 in, in what was really a coming to blows of, of France and Britain over colonial expansion, a, a sort of sign of French colonial ambitions. And here is uh, Marchand depicted presumably uh, right before or after the B Battle of Fashoda based on the, the case of, of Vichy water that's shown there, uh, proudly holding up a glass of Vichy water. So several things happening here. This is obviously tying in uh, uh, hyper-nationalism with this French colonial spa network. But another thing is happening as well, which is if you only go back to the spa every four years, what do you do in between? Well, the answer is obvious. You either take Vichy pastille, which is to say Vichy candies with the mineral salts from the, the healthful waters, or better still, you grab yourself whenever possible a bottle of Vichy water. Now, there's obviously some logic to this, right? Uh, in places where uh, the water has amoebic dysentery, you are much better off drinking a bottle of Vichy water than drinking from the stream. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is a sort of uh, sh uh, shortcut, if you will. When it's not possible to come back to France to take the waters, well, then you can take these portable waters uh, with you. All right. So I want to begin, uh, sorry, I want to turn now to the uh, French Caribbean very briefly. This is uh, a spa on the island of Guadeloupe. And this image obviously elicits a very simple comment, which is to say some of these spas were not terribly grand. They were rather improvised. Uh, the island of Guadeloupe featured at one point no fewer than 10 spas, which is really quite impressive for an island which had, what, 250,000 people in 1940. Um, and these spas were uh, believed to do different things uh, for different patients. 
Um, one of their more troubling features is that they, they featured a, a measure of racial discrimination um, uh, and even uh, segregation. Uh, and indeed, they also featured uh, gender segregation, which was more common in a lot of spas uh, at this time. So here you have the uh, men's side at Dole Les Bains. So one spa uh, on Guadeloupe was believed uh, to treat yellow fever better. Another was better believed to treat malaria. Both of these diseases con constituted considerable issues in uh, the French Caribbean until World War II. Uh, and so you can see again that this is a case of, of very practical uses of the waters. I want to suggest uh, quite briefly that in Guadeloupe, there were, of course, pre-colonial uses of the water by the Caribs and the Arawak. I don't really have time to talk much about it. It's also something about which, frankly, we, we are mostly emitting hypotheses uh, and theories more than hard facts. Um, and of course, there were also slave uses of the waters and maroon or escaped slave uses of the waters, sometimes in conjunction with other treatments, including the use of citruses uh, and lemon in particular. So there's some very interesting hybridity going on at these uh, French colonial spas in uh, Guadeloupe. The next example I want to turn to, again, I'll try to be relatively brief through this part and show you some, um, some images and maybe allow us to travel a little bit after this year of, of no travel at all. So uh, you're looking here at um, respectively a 19th century print and my uh, 20th century photo of uh, Réunion Island. And in particular, of one of Réunion's two grand spas. Um, there was one on the southern uh, Cirque known as Silaos and one in the northern Cirque shown here known as, as uh, Hellville or Salavzi. Um, hell because of Admiral Hell, not because it was in any uh, way uh, hellish. Um, and actually, uh, one of the intriguing things about, about Salavzi, if you look up the guide online of the prettiest villages of France, which is an actual organization, Les Plus, les plus Beaux Villages de France. Um, Hellville to this day is the only one that is located in a French overseas department. So it is still considered to be intrinsically very quaint, uh, very traditionally Creole. It was also the site of leisure and power in Réunion. Um, by this, I mean that the governor's de facto place of governance was Hellville. He may have theoretically governed from Saint-Denis, the biggest, uh, the only city really on the island. Uh, but in reality, as soon as he could, he escaped to uh, Hellville and its healthful waters and also its healthful air. And I wanna stress here that in many of the cases that I'm showing, it was actually a dual cure that was at work. Not only were colonials escaping, um, um, you know, the, 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 the tropical lowlands for the hills and therefore the fresher air and presumably fewer mosquitoes, they were also able to take uh, uh, either drinking cures or immersion cures in the healthful waters of uh, Hellville and Silaus. Now, one of the uh, more interesting uh, features is, is, sorry, I realize that I've not been doing this in full screen. This is probably much better. Um, one of the more interesting features of uh, um, Hellville is that it um, is eventually around the uh, 1860s, it experiences uh, um, uh, trouble from an earthquake and a cyclone. And so it is no longer the prime spa that it used to be. So this is a sort of before and after of uh, travelers' accounts of Helbourg. In 1853, a traveler wrote, what I saw was not a, the rustic thatch rotunda of years past, but a sumptuous temple dedicated to the goddess Hygieia. It featured mysterious underground crypts containing a sacred source like those of our ancient Gaulish sanctuaries, as well as bathing halls a, a, as splendidly outfitted as those of Barrage or Vichy. Uh, the bright zinc roofs reflected sunshine. So what's happening here is not only is this considered to be a sort of hygienic Greek temple, it's also a clone of home. So these spas, uh, in addition to providing air and water cures, also, I, I argue in my book, were a kind of cure for homesickness, for nostalgia. Um, they recreated uh, when it wasn't, you know, when your year wasn't up, when it wasn't year three or four to go back to Vichy, well, this was yet another shortcut. Uh, in addition to drinking Vichy waters and taking Vichy candy, you could go to the local equivalent of Vichy. Uh, and in 1853, this was clearly Helbourg Salazi. However, by 1888, another uh, visitor from Mauritius, which is a whole interesting feature about where these people are coming from, 
Mauritius, the neighboring island which had been French, was taken over by the British after the Napoleonic Wars. It had no hydromineral uh, water spa, and so its inhabitants went to neighboring Réunion. Uh, this traveler from Mauritius writes, nowadays patients can only count on the climate to regain their health here, because as much as I hate to say it, they will not be satisfied with the current state of the thermal spa, the buildings are semi-abandoned, the shower room is fa falling into ruin, the establishment is invaded by weeds. So this place is clearly no longer in its, uh, in its uh, heyday. All right, um, so... Here is another major feature of the spa at Salazi uh, Helbour, which is to say uh, it is a place where troops can become reinvigorated. And so the troops, which uh, were stationed sometimes for uh, many years on end, uh, would get first crack at the thermal waters. Indeed, um, I argue in my book that really this thermal empire, this empire of spas, begins after France's conquest of Algeria in 1830. And some of the very first to benefit from these curative regimes are actually French colonial soldiers returning from the campaign in Algeria. So this is no longer uh, obviously the campaign in Algeria. These are soldiers who in 1885 and then later in 1895, 1896, are involved in the campaign, uh, the French campaigns against Madagascar, uh, a first campaign in 1885, as I suggested. Um, both of these campaigns featured far more deaths by disease than deaths uh, at the hands of enemy bullets. And so uh, patients who were desperately ill were either repatriated directly to the homeland, or if they couldn't make that trip, then they were sent to the spa at uh, Salazi. These are some of my pictures from, well, gosh, 21 years ago now. This is not rejuvenating for me. But anyway, um, these are a few of my pictures of the uh, spa uh, uh, ruins at Salazi. And if you look carefully in the center, you can actually see the place where uh, the drinking was taking place. Again, there were both bathing and water ingestion uh, 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 rituals at uh, Salazi. And here is a picture, a uh, contemporaneous picture of Silaos in 1885, the other major spa on the southern side of the island, which begins to gain in importance precisely as Salazi's declines uh, around this time in the 1880s thereabouts. Turning next to Madagascar, uh, the first point I want to make is, of course, this, this deep connection between Réunion and Madagascar. Um, the, the Réunionese lobby, if you will, was instrumental in both uh, French campaigns of 1885 and 1895 against Madagascar. Uh, Réunionese uh, entrepreneurs wanted outlets in Madagascar. They wanted cheap labor in Madagascar. They played a determining role in deciding the invasion of Madagascar. The next point I want to make is that uh, the, the, the French conquest is, is finished in 1896, uh, but actually there had been uses of the waters at Antirabe in Highland Madagascar long before. Obviously uses by Malagasy people, I'll return to that in a second, but also uses by missionaries. And missionaries had carved up Madagascar into several zones. The London Missionary Society was very present, uh, but so too uh, were the Norwegian missionaries. So this project took me amongst other places to Stavanger, Norway, where I was able to see the papers and photos of the Norwegian missionaries who had been present at Ansira Bay. So here is uh, a Norwegian pastor Rosas overseeing the canalization, the tapping of the spring at Ansira Bay in uh, 1900. If you look carefully, you can see that there's actually three water geysers uh, in front of you, all of them producing uh, hot uh, mineral water. Now, again, this uh, is nothing new. Uh, the Malagasy elites were using these waters for decades, if not centuries. This is the earliest known photo of the spa at Ansira Bay. It's from, we believe, 1882, and it shows the Queen Ranavalona's uh, bathhouse at Ansira Bay uh, before the French conquest. If you look in the background, you can see mountains of little hills of salt uh, which is one of the many uh, uh, minerals present in Ansira Bay's healthful uh, waters. And uh, interestingly, in the 1890s, there were really only two buildings, the Queen's Bathhouse and the Missionary Bathhouse uh, shown here. This is to show you some of the pre-colonial hot water uses in Madagascar. Some uh, were uh, tied to a variety of cultural 
uh, links. Uh, you can see in the background of Baobab in the foreground, uh, two uh, Malagasy bathers. Uh, they were believed to treat everything from skin afflictions to uh, so-called intermittent fevers. And so the waters had definitely been used by local peoples for uh, centuries. However, the zenith of Antirabe in terms of uh, development and use uh, is uh, certainly the French colonial era. And here you see uh, a series of stereoscopic pictures from the uh, 1920s showing uh, the Grand Spa Hotel and Grand Spa Building under construction. You also have this attempt to clone France overseas and specifically clone the grandness of uh, the French imperial spa from the era of Napoleon III uh, in uh, the highlands of Madagascar. So here you have the uh, new train station in the background. All of this developed around the spa at Antirabe. And my point about cloning is made very clear with this postcard. This is a postcard from 1907, and a homesick colonial has written very clearly in French on the front of the card, ne dirait-on pas un joli bourg de France? Doesn't it look like a pretty village in France? It doesn't to me, but for a homesick colonial, it uh, undoubtedly uh, must have. And the cloning actually goes all the way to the buildings themselves. Because for those of you who know Vichy, this is actually a vague replica of one of the gris, one of the places where you can take the waters. Um, and here we are in the 1920s. And the very name that is given to it is Rano Vizi, which is to say Vichy water in Malagasy. And I don't, I, let me actually, let me go to my shelf and show you a bottle of Vichy water. I'll be right back. I, sh I probably should have had my prop handy, but here it is. This is a bottle of Rano VC uh, from uh, uh, about 10 years ago. So as you can see, uh, this connection with the portable waters that I've been describing is something that still endures uh, today. And as I mentioned, these spas are uh, still very much popular. This is a picture from the 1950s showing the sort of grandness of the uh, major hotel there. Uh, all right, I want to turn uh, uh, lastly to North Africa before returning home to the spas in France. So uh, I'll be brief here, but this is the spa at Amamrira, uh, Algeria in 1878. Notice uh, some of the interesting motifs on the spa and notice as well um, the density of these spas in Algeria. So this quote drives home just the, the sheer number of spas, uh, each one catering to a different urban era, area. So Amam Berda lay, lies halfway between Bonn and Constantine, Amam Mekutkin between uh, Gelma uh, and then uh, near Biskra, you have another one, the Queen's Baths in the suburbs of Oran, Hamam Maluan and, uh, uh, and another near, near Algiers, and finally Hamam uh, Rira, uh, about 100 uh, kilometers from uh, the capital. This quote is from 1878. It reads, this hydro mineral density meant that colonials could readily take the waters on location. So um, another feature of these waters, returning to a point I made for Guadeloupe, is uh, the uh, pre-colonial uses being ridiculed by colonials, even though in many ways they are a, a sort of mere effect of them. So at Hamamrira in Algeria in 1880, a Dr. Renard derided the supposedly irrational, superstitious, and unscientific use of the waters by locals. He railed, I will let you be the judge of such thermal treatments. Establishments in France would yield mediocre therapeutic results and slim profit margins if their bathers behaved the way indigenous Africans do. So in particular, the doctor was outraged by the fact that these indigenous bathers weren't using the graduated glass, which showed you exactly how much water you were ingesting at any given time. And another feature then is, as I mentioned, segregation. Uh, ultimately, I write separation was seen as the solution for distinguishing European from indigenous uh, water practices. In Algeria, the second half of the 19th century, spas had been completely segregated. Thus, a colonial doctor wrote of Amamrira in 1879, the civil establishment is divided in two parts, one reserved to Arabs in the foreground, in front one sees a small Moorish cafe with on either side rooms where the Arabs can rest after their bath. Further back, four pools are reserved to them. Behind that and high above stands the European spa building. And so as a result, in 1883, a certain Dr. Brandt was able to reassure another clientele, which is to say British customers, uh, about the strict segregation in place at the spa. Quote, there are distinct and separate baths for visitors at this hotel. 
for the Jews, an establishment apart from the hotel, and for the Arabs in a building in front and below the hotel. Visitors, visitors fe need fear no annoyance or inconvenience from the latter, though they do flock in numbers. So here you have uh, essentially the uh, doctor saying, well, uh, yes, it's used by locals, but you will be completely separated from them and therefore uh, they will not bother you in any way. In neighboring Tunisia as well, a strong hydromineral uh, complex highlighted by this spa at Corbus. I should add that for Algeria and uh, um, uh, Tunisia, the dual nature, the sort of climatology and hydrotherapy nature is slightly less clear because these are not, as you can see, high altitude cures. Uh, but, but according to the French logic of thermalisme and climatisme, these were considered climatic cures as well because of the fresh breezes brought by the proximity of uh, the Mediterranean. So here again, the same theme where colonials uh, uh, were uh, uh, heaping scorn on uh, non on, on uh, indigenous Tunisian uh, uses of the waters, quote, Muslims and Jews follow a 21 day cure that can be extended to 40 days. This period of real activity is that of 21 days divided into three seven day chunks. The number seven is significant. It's considered a fateful number and Arabs have a blind uh, confidence in it. So what's fascinating here is that um, the Tunisians were using exactly the same 21 day cure as the French. Uh, but rather than ascribe this to either coincidence or you know the way the 21 cure work 21 day cure works it was derided as superstitious in the tunisian uh, case all right so i want to actually in the last part take us uh, home to the spas in france this on the right is a picture of the many 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 spas uh, present on uh, the french uh, mainland and on the left sorry as well as in corsica and on the left, my uh, little list of the ones that catered to colonials. So this includes Vitel, Plombière, Vichy, Roya, La Bourboule, um, uh, Vals-les-Bains, Ancos-les-Termes, Dax, as well as uh, Retza in Corsica. So you can see that that is a fair number of spas that catered uh, specifically to colonials. It's not all of the ones on that list, but this is ones that really made uh, colonial customers a key part of their clientele. There's many dynamics at work. One is the tension between the spas in France and the spas in the colonies, and another is the tension between spas in France that treated malaria and places like Marienbad in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which also were believed uh, to be effective against malaria. So this quote from 1924, indicates, quote, we must try on the one hand to favor by all means possible the exodus of foreigners and wealthy natives from our empire to our metropolitan thermal stations, thereby bringing to us part of the clientele that used to frequent the Kurhaus palaces of Central Europe. On the other hand, we must not neglect our colonial thermal domain that is henceforth part of our national heritage, and it is now necessary to encourage scientific investigation of spas that seem so promising in these new distant Frances. So competition between spas at home and spas overseas, between East European, Central European spas and French spas. As I mentioned, there is an entire spin-off around these bottles. This one is an intriguing bottle label because it specifically is uh, uh, targeting colonials. It says natural waters from the Vichy Basin at saint Pierre, and this one is considered to be explicitly uh, uh, targeting colonials. It's not just the state, of course, that is operating this. There's also individual agency at work. And a key example here is missionaries, because since the separation of church and state in France in 1905, missionaries were no longer able to benefit from the cures the same way as these colonial officials were. I want to stress that the colonial officials went on a paid 21-day furlough back to France, their expenses paid to return, all of their expenses paid while at the cure. Uh, well, missionaries used to benefit from this in the 1890s. Uh, suddenly the break between church and state meant that they no longer did. And a, a missionary by the name of Father Vate set up this missionary house at Vichy to house missionaries uh, coming uh, for cures. So here's a couple of uh, testimonies. Uh, the one, uh, sorry, this is one testimony in both languages. 
Um, this is Father Joulot uh, writing, quote, missionary in Togo for nearly 17 years and having twice taken a season at Vichy, like all of my sick colleagues, I lamented the isolation in which God's bush ranger found himself in this town. Your beautiful work, Father Vete, has finally answered the wish of our dear patients. By prolonging the life of missionaries who, knew, who know the cultures and languages of the people they seek to evangelize, you have well served the cause of religion and of the nation. May God bless the missionary house and its devoted founder. So this is the spa complex, no longer just as welfare state, but as perpetuating empire. In other words, missionaries acquire skills that can't easily be duplicated. You can't just teach somebody uh, an African language in a year. And these missionaries' lives are therefore precious and they need to be uh, protected uh, by Vichy's healthful waters. This is a slightly more tongue in cheek uh, uh, homage to the uh, uh, missionary house. It is an excerpt from a poem written by a grateful missionary after taking the waters. They come at present from India and Japan, from Patagonia and Gabon, are apostles from all points of the horizon. They rush to this modern Bethany under the healthful skies of the motherland to find new life at Vichy. Notice that this is a, once about formal and informal empire. Yes, France had colonies in India and Gabon, but you know, Japan and Patagonia, uh, not at all. And so this is about uh, both formal and informal. Another point I need to make very quickly is that, of course, this cosmopolitanism, the fact that you know, there are missionaries, there's also indigenous elites, the emperors of Anam, uh, the uh, deposed uh, uh, monarch of Madagascar, all of these people take the waters at Vichy. Um, th there's a kind of ambient cosmopolitanism at Vichy already in which this colonial culture gets grafted. So this is the uh, um, 1901 guide to uh, foreigners at Vichy on the right. You have, I think, a nod to probably Russia and Japan, uh, maybe to the Middle East as well. You, of course, have exotic references in uh, the very architecture of Vichy as well as shown on uh, these two images. And last but not least, you have uh, um, vignettes that show us this really reverse colonial encounter taking place between uh, colonial elites who come to take the water at Vichy and uh, the local Vichy population. So remember, Vichy was not Marseille, it wasn't Nantes, it wasn't Le Havre, it wasn't a port where people would have seen a lot of, of Africans or North Africans or, or Southeast Asians. And so here you have a caricature uh, showing in uh, uh, 1882 uh, a milkmaid and a laundry maid's reaction to encountering those who I think on the far left are probably colonial soldiers. One says to the other, heavens, my dear, what country do these people come from? The other answers, from a country where men each have four to five wives. Good Lord, says the other, let us hope that they don't introduce that fashion to Vichy. So under this tongue in cheek uh, dialogue between these two working class women, you actually have a reverse colonial encounter uh, taking place in uh, the homeland. There are other spin-offs as well. This one was particularly displeasing to Vichy doctors who considered that in addition to malaria and yellow fever, a lot of their patients were actually suffering from uh, liver troubles induced by alcohol. Um, but even nevertheless, uh, you have this linkage between uh, this liqueur associated with Vichy and the colonies. And as I mentioned earlier, it wasn't just the waters. Uh, doctors were also inviting patients to uh, pop a number of pills during their stay at Vichy, which were also considered to help the colonial uh, liver. One last very quick comment is that, of course, Vichy was not alone. This is a bottle of Vals les Bains water, and it is uh, described as being particularly useful for colonial afflictions. And you'll see that the label is even partly translated into Arabic. And here is an ad for Ancosa's water, which is described as being that which is par excellence for the colonies, a cure for the malarials uh, at uh, uh, their uh, place of posting. And this is Vals les Bains in 1910. You can see that high society was congregating here. And I actually went through the registers of those arriving to try to see uh, how many were coming in from the colonies. Uh, intriguingly, some of them actually stayed at villas, which were titled uh, the villa of the colony. So as you can see, there's all of these nods to these colonial uh, linkages. I'm going to close now in the last 30 seconds with 
uh, the reinventions of these spas today. Uh, well, Guadeloupe spas were bastions of whiteness in the colonial era. You can see from this image from a now defunct website, this was in about 2000, that uh, they were inviting local Guadeloupian women to take the waters for so-called relaxing treatments and no longer to uh, treat malaria and yellow fever. This is a modern day ad for Silaosa's water. And you can see that what, what's being advertised is again, not an anti-malarial uh, uh, potion, but the healthfulness of nature. Uh, last but not least, this is a mural I photographed in 2001 showing uh, a Malagasy man and Malagasy woman drinking the healthful water of Ansira Bay. There's several symbols here. One is obviously the symbol of health in the snake. The other is the traveler's tree, which is the symbol of Madagascar. And then the water mean, the, the message means water that cleanses, water that gives life. And this is my final slide. It shows some of the curative treatments being advertised at Al in uh, the at the turn of this century. Uh, those include liver disease, gastric disease, diabetes, uh, intestinal diseases, respiratory infections, rheumatism, gout, skin afflictions, uh, gynecological problems, sterility, hypertension, and hypotension. And my final comment will be that, of course, in places like Madagascar, where uh, the health system is strained, Ansirabe has taken on a new life as a kind of alternate medical hub. Thanks very much for your attention. Happy to field any questions or comments after uh, Martin's commentary. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Eric. It was really interesting. Um, Martin, then we can go for your comments and then the, the questions. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, I also want to thanks again the uh, organizers for inviting me to um, comment on this very interesting uh, paper uh, by uh, Professor Jennings. Uh, I don't really have a kind of overall narrative for my comments. I just have some um, ideas, comments coming from my own background on indeed the research on the Belgian Congo and the similarities or the differences and then some questions also to me may need to like kickstart the further uh, discussion. I also seen that there are um, already some comments and questions um, in the chat. Um, but yeah, first of all, uh, thank you uh, Professor Jennings for the very interesting uh, paper. Also the very uh, beautiful visual material uh, about this very um, yeah, intriguing topic of the, the colonial spa where I, I noticed or I think that a lot of um, contradictions and tensions and sometimes even ironies that are very much part of, of um, medical scientific world of the 19 and 20, early 20th century, but also of, of colonialism and colonial regimes. Because um, um, uh, as someone also asked in the chat, if there are like Belgian equivalents, I don't know of any Belgian equivalents of this spa treatments, especially not in Congo itself, while of course also the uh, Belgian colonials had a lot of health issues, especially in the early uh, decades of colonialism and this, and um, yeah, the medical support was a big issue. Um, and indeed also, um, yeah, the life expectancy of, for instance, missionaries, the people that I uh, study, were not very high actually the the, the development of a, a kind of a missionary um, missionary medical organization which I study actually was kickstarted by the uh, high amount of missionaries um, dying in um, the Congo um, and then I I wondered this um, of course for instance, in the Belgian Congo, there also existed this culture of health manuals uh, that had to um, uh, help, yeah, basically uh, Belgians in the Congo to survive um, these very different um, circumstances. But for instance, um, the use of water is advised against, except when having fever, mm -hmm. and also then the absence of colonial spas in the Belgian Congo. I was wondering this. Um, 
abundance of um, French colonial spa is that the kind of uh, a consequence of the, the importance and like the long shadow of climatism and thermalism in, in France? And is that like very specific something that is part of both the scientific and the colonial cultural, culture of France, which is this inheritance of um, climatism and, and thermalism? Um, And also um, another one uh, of the tensions that uh, struck me and that I also recognized from my own uh, research, I kind of uh, recognized the, maybe what you could call the emotional life world of these um, colonizers, like the feelings of alienation, of homesickness. Um, but actually with uh, the colonial actors that I study, missionaries, uh, missionary doctors, um, these feelings were very much cultivated and very much romanticized mm. the harshness of um, working in a rural uh, colonial context, indeed missing one's family, feeling this the homesickness. Actually, they were really not uh, resisted or seen as something that had to be solved, but rather as something that was romanticized. And then I was wondering if you could comment or say something about these tensions between, um, on the one hand, um, the kind of, of image of, of bravery that had to go with this colonial imaginary, but on the other side, the kind of fragility of these same colonial actors, which, and, and indeed their, their fragile emotional life world that also is connected to um, the spa experience and why these spas uh, were there both from a health perspective as, as from a the kind of emotional indeed homesickness and um, um, those uh, yeah kind of feelings um, and then another tension that um, interested me and you um, briefly touched upon it already uh, but it's maybe interesting, I would maybe be interested in hearing a bit more about that is about the gender um, dimension. As you said that like there were separate spas or uh, separate moments for men and women to uh, visit this spa. Um, but I was wondering, were there also um, considered differences in um, this, this fragility or um, the, kind of, the kind of diseases uh, that men and women had to be uh, treated for and were, because um, for instance, in the Belgian Congo, in the first decades of uh, colonization, um, women were really seen as not being um, fit to go to the colony because the circumstances were too harsh for women to, um, uh, to go there. And um, it's only after the First World War that this is, starting to change, um, but also because medical facilities were becoming more um, available in the Belgian Congo. And I was wondering if that was also maybe the case for these colonial spas that they were also seen as enablers of, um, um, yeah, colonizing or of empire in general, but also more specific of having women in mm -hmm. this colonial um, context. And then maybe my, my last remark or question um, was about, which is also something that you've already briefly touched upon, but that I would like to hear more on when you were talking about, um, for instance, the Norwegian missionaries present in French um, colonies, but also um, French uh, colonizers visiting Central European spas is about this transnational an element of the spas as well research into colonialism in general but um, also colonial medicine and colonial science has been um, throughout the, the, the last decades enlarged in the scope from like looking at very specific the colonial context to more indeed colonial metropolitan um, um, dynamics to even more largely also um, 
yeah, the connections between um, separate companies and between empires. And I was wondering if that, if you could elaborate a bit more about that, if there were, for instance, um, British tourists who went to visit um, French spas in French colonies, or indeed, for instance, missionaries from uh, missionary, not necessarily colonial countries like Norway, who also used this pass and how they experienced it and how these, these French spas or French colonials dealt with the presence of um, foreign tourists or um, actors from other empires or other um, countries. Um, so yeah, I think that was a bit what I've written down. Um, yeah, so maybe um, you could try to elaborate a bit on the different topics or aspects of, of if you want or can. Thank you. Those are all excellent comments. Um, what should I do at this point? Should I answer uh, some of Martin's questions or should we take some of the... I, they're all excellent. I'm happy to start anywhere. I think we can start with the, uh, the comments from Martin and then move on to the question. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'll begin with your last one about transnationalism, um, because it's a really interesting one. Yes, uh, these missionaries from uh, Norway had been in Madagascar for decades before the French arrived. And what's fascinating, uh, fortunately, I had a very good um, Danish PhD student at the time, and I was able to get her to read the old Norwegian sources. Um, and what she found was that uh, Rosas already in the 1880s and 1870s, so long before the French got there, was making the analogy with Vichy. He was doing the testing of the waters and comparing them chemically with the composition of the waters at Vichy. So this shows that Vichy isn't just a Franco-French story. It, its reputation already extended to Oslo and by extension to these missionaries who left for Madagascar. So that's one interesting angle. The other is absolutely, there were a number, so at uh, the missionary house is a prime example of transnationalism um, and it has archival records. It's a tiny little place. I mean, if the missionary doesn't like you, you don't get to see the records, it's, it's private. So um, there's no guarantee that you could, or you, know, you could go today and get in and go tomorrow and not get in. It's, it's uh, this way with private archives. But I was very fortunate to get in and to be able to photograph some of these letters from missionaries to the head of the organization, Father Vette. And one of the obvious things about them is that they come from all over the place. There's Belgians, there's Germans, there's, uh, which you don't necessarily expect, right? There's, uh, there's Portuguese, there's Spanish people, there's uh, Dutch people, uh, there's a lot of Brits, uh, quite a few Scots. Um, it, it's really very, very transnational. And they all say the same thing, which is thank God you were here, uh, giving us free accommodation at Vichy. We can't afford the grand palaces at Vichy, and yet our livers require us to be here. So this suggests that the, the, the liver logic is, is not just Franco-French. Um, and then the final example is uh, the many, many Mauritians who take the waters at Réunion. So it's a complicated case because Mauritius used to be called Ile de France, and as I explained, it became British after the defeat of Napoleon. So in 1815, it suddenly becomes a British colony. Its inhabitants continue to go to Réunion and they go for two things. One, to go shopping for things from Paris that they can no longer find now that Mauritius has gone into the orbit of London. And the other is to take the waters. Um, and the paradox is in the mid 19th century, long before the cult of the beach and the, pine, the, 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 the palm tree, um, really what they're seeking is healthfulness in the highlands and salubrious waters of Réunion. So that tourism, that local Indian Ocean tourism from Mauritius to Réunion is very, very strong. And if you read the Mauritian press, everybody talks about, you know, this is where we went last summer. This year, maybe we'll go to Silaos instead of Salazie. There's the rivalry between the two of them. There's a whole little Mauritian community that sets up shop in Réunion. And they also comment on how, especially prior to the construction of the Suez Canal, there's Brits who are coming and going to uh, the Raj, to India, who stop over and uh, on the way back and try to get a little bit healthier by staying at the spas of Réunion. So there's many, many transnational connections. And frankly, they'd be worth a, a whole other study that I just, you know, I, I didn't have access to. Um, 
So that's, that's the transnational side. The health manuals you mentioned were very, very useful for me. And I made very good use of them in my first two chapters. Um, and these health manuals insist on several things. You're quite right. Many of them say avoid water, but by this, they mean the local water of the streams. Um, going to bathe in healthful mineral waters accredited by the Ministry of the Colonies, that's a whole other different thing. They talk about, you know, the threats posed by the soil. You can't, if you live in a, uh, a tropical house, you're best to stay one floor up and not be on the, the ground floor. So very different from the British with their bungalows. They insist on the importance of the pith helmet as a great protector against the tropics. And of course, until about 1900, as you suggested, they insist that only men can survive the tropical heat. In France, this really starts to change around the 1890s. Um, before then, yes, there were colonial settlers in Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, which was obviously not a hot, a hot climate, but also in Algeria, uh, which was considered hot, but not tropical, Mediterranean. And by the 1890s, the debate begins about whether French women and children can survive Indochina. And by about 1900, there's more and more French women and children in Indochina. I'm not even gonna talk about the Métis question because that's, that's a whole other topic. So uh, all of these things are, are connected. You're absolutely right about the emotional life of the colonizers. This really is at the heart of my book. I didn't bring it out quite as much in this paper, um, but these, these feelings of, of homesickness on the one hand versus you're quite right, this notion of bravery, especially amongst missionaries, this pride that you would actually have the scars of the colony on your liver as one of the sources that I looked at said, real pride at suffering, almost masochistic pride at suffering. Um, is reflected in a lot of those sources. But yes, you also touched upon the key, which is to the fragility that I described, the fact that these people can't go four years without going back to take the waters back home is a clear and averred sign of fragility. They're also claiming that their dominance is superior because of their whiteness. And this inherent contradiction is what you see uh, at the heart of, of France's empire, just as it is at the heart of other empires. I think I'm going to leave it at that. I don't know whether this is just a Franco-French story. Final comment. Um, there have been articles that have talked about uh, the Brits taking the waters at Bath uh, after returning from India. It seems to me that this is mostly in the 17th and 18th century, that by the 19th and 20th century, um, the British are relying much more on hill stations. So Darjeeling, Otakamun, Shimla, um, and indeed the French are too. My, the book that I wrote after this one was on Dalat, the big French hill station in Indochina. Um, so the logic of altitude and the logic of, of water are always competing in the French colonial context. So it seems to me that for the, I, I, this is a sweeping generalization, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Dutch and British logics, the logic of altitude wins out in the 19th century and the emphasis is placed in the Dutch colonies on places like Bandung and other hill stations in Indonesia, and in the British context on Simla and Darjeeling in Otakamu. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for these uh, elaborate uh, answers, um, which, yeah, I think your, your case study and your research, and now again, your, your comments, they really showed indeed that the potential of looking even further into this past for both transnational aspect and, and things like inter intercolonial connectedness, um, but also yeah, the many tensions and ironies and of yeah that are inherent to um, colonial also what you what you said about uh, masochism even I, I recognize that also Belgian doctors, especially um, doctors attached to the military, but also the missionaries that they complain about that uh, these people do not follow their advice and that they don't want to have uh, and get the medical care that they uh, can provide out of a kind of yeah, colonial or Western um, pride. There's, there's another feature there, which is mental health. I mean, there's an almost, yeah, con there's an almost Conradian madness associated with the, co with the colonies, which also can be treated at the spas. Um, so that's a whole other psychological disease is treated at the spas is a whole other angle that I need that I could have ventured into and that somebody should. Yeah, that was, that was actually also in, in my notes about uh, what the, the kind of if mental health was indeed seen as a problem and also as something that could be treated 
in the past, or maybe that it was also a taboo amongst these. Uh... It was recognized that the colonies could make you mad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have any further comments, questions. I don't know. Um, thank, how... thank you. Well, there's mm -hmm. lots of questions in the comments. In the chat, so in the so, chat yeah. sorry. So um, we can start with Robin or Robin. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, you... my, my question has already been answered. So let's continue with the second question. And if okay. I can just add something about, uh, related to this question, I, I was reading about the uh, um, Italian and fascism, and apparently there was something like this. So like Italian, when they lived abroad, they had a moment where they could stay in a, in a climatic station or in the spa thermal station to cultivate and uh, find again the Italianness. So, there is a yeah, parallel with the French uh, system. That's very interesting. I need to work more on this, but it's also hard to find uh, archives. And I think that's also what you point out in your uh, study. And that it was quite interesting to, to see that you found new archives uh, from the colonial um, archives in Aix-en-Provence. Uh, but sometimes, yeah. Yeah, those are basically the personnel files. So. Um, you know, nine tenths of it are irrelevant to the topic because nine tenths of it are how they did in school and uh, uh, whether they needed financial help. And uh, but then you find these two or three notes from doctors telling them to go to Chatel Grillon and to go to Vichy. So somebody would have to go through all what seventy thousand files uh, to look for these medical notes. I've been through about thirty. Um, so what I said about you know nine out of ten of them contain medical notes should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt with respect to scale. And then we had a question from Oliver. Yeah, hello everybody and thank you Professor Jennings for your talk. It's very uh, inspiring and I'm really looking forward to reading your book, um, which I should. So I'm researching on 19th century Austrian spa towns and um, for me it was remarkable to see that um, architectural styles even in smaller spa towns were reflecting like local or vernacular um, traditions in, in, in architecture. And uh, it was also interesting to see that architectural magazines, for example, in Vienna were publishing um, examples of uh, such architecture and not as a kind of a funny thing, but as a serious thing and as a um, um, also scientific approach, I would say to history of architecture in these uh, regions. So um, my question would be, uh, are you aware of uh, kind of similar um, um, things in the French Empire so that maybe in Paris at the Poly Ecole Polytechnique were um, discussing about colonial architecture and spa architecture in colonies or um, yeah do you know any architects or something like that so I would be really thrilled to know more about that. Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I know quite a bit more about the architecture of Dalat, the French colonial hill station in Indochina, um, which again was all about reminders of home. And as I are, so my next book was called Imperial Heights. It's about Dalat. And I have a whole chapter in, on architecture in which I explained that there is a regionalist fashion fascination. So you have some villas that are Basque, some villas which are Breton, some villas which are Corsican, whatever these things mean, right? The, the, these notions were being fixed in the late 19th century, in part as local forms were actually disappearing. Um, and they get reflected not at the spa town in this case, but at the high altitude hill station. Um, what I would suggest is for some of the smaller towns that I described, like encos les termes and Vals-les-Bains, um, there is a hint of exoticism that is tied to the colonial function of these colonial spas. To give you one example, uh, Vals actually had a mosque briefly. Um, and that was because of the elites from Algeria and Tunisia that came to take the waters at vals les -Bains. Um, And as some of the images that I showed you of Vichy probably reveal, there is a kind of Orientalist fascination at the same time. Now, I don't want to overplay my cards because there's also an Orientalist fascination in downtown Marseille and downtown Paris, right? There's just an Orientalist fascination everywhere. So it becomes very hard to parse how much of that is just ambient and how much of that is directly connected to the colonial link that I'm trying to make. So again, I'm very careful not to overplay my hand with, with architecture. 
but it's a fascinating question. And I'd love to hear more about the, the regionalist um, and local, almost folkloric uh, angle that you're discussing. I look forward to reading you on this. Do you have an article out on it already? Or, yeah. Not yet. Oh, okay. Not yet. Not okay. Yet. I look forward Thanks. to reading. Uh, Kathleen? Yeah, um, my question, I guess, is somewhat of a follow-up uh, of what you were just saying. Um, you talked a lot about how they were trying to kind of bring the essence of France and these French towns and spa, spa towns and, and culture to the colonies. And I was curious if you came across any evidence of the reverse. Um, I know that there was kind of this air of superiority against indigenous cultures and practices, but um, maybe in the mode of exoticism or orientalism, if you saw um, these spa towns in France uh, in terms of either their culture or treatments kind of taking inspiration from uh, the colonies. I think this is another realm of irony because the rhetoric, as you suggest, is all about, well, these are our French cures. They have nothing to do with these absurd indigenous clique cures, even though they're each 21 days in length, which is astonishing if you think about it. But anyway, um, but yes, there are all sorts of uh, fashions at the spas in France. Most of them are not explicitly articulated as colonial. A great many of them are described as Turkish or vaguely North African. Mm -hmm. So the term hammam is introduced very widely as of the 19th century into the French medical vernacular. Um, and uh, it, that is a kind of confusion because in North Africa, you've got these spas that I've been describing like Amam Meskutin, where does the religious end? Where does the sort of ritualistic bathing begin? And where does the colonial therapy uh, start? Um, it becomes very hard to, to kind of uh, distinguish these things. So I would suggest that no, for instance, to, to, to bounce off of what you said in the, in the, in the chat, they don't introduce the citrus treatment, for instance, which sounds fascinating. I mean, I wish I knew more about the citrus treatment. Um, but instead, they, uh, they, they, they call things the, the hammam, which is, I suppose, a kind of nod to the outside world. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now we have a question from Thomas. Uh, yes, I have two questions. Uh, the first, perhaps you have said a few words about it and uh, then I missed it. Um, you were talking about doctors from the colonies sending uh, the guys home to the spas in France. Are there also examples that people from France are sent extra to the colonies to some spa because that spa was very helpful and could offer something that couldn't be offered by those 50, I would say 50 spas in France. That would be my first question. And my second question is, what's the reason that Fichy became the most famous of all? Is it a better quality of water? Is it a better climate? Uh, how to explain that, especially Fichy, before Fichy became known because, because of the Fichy regime, but it shows, of course, it, with, with that reason that it was famous, that it became famous. Is there an explanation or is it just accidental, so to say? That's my second question. Okay, so on the first question, the answer is pretty unconditionally no, because it, there was that incredible tension that I described between the spas at home and the spas in the colonies and these doctors paying all of this lip service to, well, we're on the same team. As long as people don't go to Austria or Germany, we're happy. You know, the people, the people in Guadeloupe and Réunion and metropolitan France, we're all playing on the same side, except in reality, they almost never sent somebody to take the waters in Tunisia or Guadeloupe because they were trying to escape those places uh, to go home. So the only example that I can think of that is close to that is Corbus actually, and I know this because I found an ad for Corbus waters in the archives in Hanoi. Corbus actually wrote to all of the colonies saying, we are very well located for you to come and take a 21 day cure on your way home as a kind of decompression chamber so that you don't get the bends. This is my metaphor, but uh, you, you, a decompression chamber before coming home. You, you're coming back by ship, you make a stopover in North Africa, and then you go back to central France. Um, so that's the only example that I can that I can think of. So yes, I found in the in in, in uh, the the archives in, in Hanoi, in the National Archives of Vietnam, an ad for Corbus vaunting this very function as a kind of stopover. How many people actually did this? I don't know. Um, 
As for Vichy's fame, uh, it's an interesting question. It's, it's you know, the Vichy waters go back to Roman times, uh, but most historians of Vichy would argue that the spa really takes off, really gains fame thanks to Napoleon III's passion for the place and that he and the Empress, uh, their presence there, just like their presence at Arcachon, means that very quickly a train line connects Vichy to Paris and therefore People want to emulate and copy what the court is doing, what the emperor is doing, and they start to go. So it becomes a bourgeois site because it is the site of the emperor. It, it's more complicated than that as well. Um, there's no doubt that um, th those waters had gained fame for a long time. One, one, one of the reasons I came to this topic, to be perfectly honest with everybody, is that my, my PhD thesis was on the Vichy regime in the colonies. And when I was reading about the Vichy regime, I thought, isn't it strange that there was a missionary house at Vichy? I mean, wh what were missionaries doing at Vichy? It's not near any port. Why would they go up the Allier when they... And so it's there that I started to understand that, you know, the, the, the anti-Jewish ministry that the Vichy regime had was housed in a place called the Algeria Hotel. Why was there an Algeria Hotel at Vichy? I started to wonder. And it's this that got me to this topic. Um, so there is a connection between the regime and, and the, the other function. And why did Napoleon III prefer Vichy or is it just by accident? No, I, no think, it, I think it's partly an accident because he, he, he frequented all sorts of different spas in France and some of them he gave his favor to, others he did not. Um, I'm not really sure. Hmm. But it really is a second empire city the same way as Paris is. Um, you know, it really takes off in, in the Second Empire. Before that, it was just a little unimportant town. Fairly unimportant town, exactly. Okay, thank you. Vicky, <laughs> uh, you had a question? Yes. Thank you, Professor Jennings, for a very, very inspiring talk. I have two short questions. The first is a follow question to the one Kathleen asked. Uh, what about the tapped waters from the colonies? Did they find their way to France? Were they imported also to France? And the second question is, who did take a cure in the colony spas? If, if people were, ex I mean, why, why did they have spas in the colonies when there was Vichy? So why did they well, why did people go to Vichy to cure from the colonies? And what treatments did they have in the colonies in difference, uh, different from those in Vichy and other French spas? So I haven't really got the idea why they had colony, why they had spas in the colonies if they had yes. the, the spas in the motherland. Okay, thank you. Excellent question. So the, the first answer is again, unfortunately, no. Um, this bottle I had to go to Madagascar to get, my Rano Vizi water, which again means Vichy water in Malgache, which is incredible because um, in Malagasy. Um, anyway, uh, these waters were consumed only locally. Um, and the metropole in, in you know classic colonial relations, the metropole had a complete monopoly over uh, its waters. It's a little bit like asking whether one can find non-French wine bottles in France today. The answer is yes, if you look very, very hard, but you go to any Nicolas wine emporium and the foreign wine shelf is like this and then everything else is French wine. Well, the same is going on with the waters. Vichy, Plombière, Vitel, all of these waters are mass exported to the colonies and the economy of scale is such that poor Ranovisi can only compare it can only compete locally. Um, but what's interesting is Ranovisi already at the turn of the 20th century, um, wealthy, noble Malagasy are ordering it. Uh, and so at first they're ordering it in buckets and barrels. And then gradually by 1900, they're already bottling it in Ansirabe and taking it up to five hours to the capital of Antananarivo. So that locally, there's definitely that, that commerce of the other bottles. Excellent question about why do you even need spas in the colony? The answer is because you only get to go home to Vichy every three years. And what do you do the rest of the time? And so they are seen, I have guides that show them as the exact replica. Uh, one of the guides that I didn't photograph for us here today says, Plombière equals Dolé, uh, Antirabé equals Vichy. So you know, based on which one your doctor told you to go to back home, which one to go to locally. 
Um, and each one has the brevier thermal des coloniaux, that guide I was describing earlier, tells you exactly this one is for the liver, this one is for the spleen, this one is for amoebic dysentery, this one is for colonial nostalgia, um, and a few of them actually, you know, check off both boxes. But the short answer is, uh, doctors were encouraging uh, colonials to take a cure once every two months. And they're in constant battles with the colonial ministry, which is only willing to pay for them to come home every two to four years or every two to six years. Um, and so this is the answer. The short term answer is um, take the waters on location. And I didn't get a chance to, to talk about it, but in Guadeloupe, the very first spas were set up in the early 19th century for the troops, again, uh, to keep them uh, uh, healthy during, during the, the bad season. You couldn't bring them home. It was too great an expense. Well, then you'd keep them at the spa. So it was a way of preserving people, preserving colonials when they couldn't go back home. Going back home was always seen as the best option. There's one other reason, and that is if you're so sick that you can't get on the boat. Um, and you see that described quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then a last question from, uh, for the moment from uh, Chloe. Chloe Shah. Hi, I've, I'm just I'm I'm meeting myself. Um, I have two questions, which are which I realised as I was writing them are vaguely interrelated. Um, the first one is that um, when you were touching on fears generated around around hydrotherapy, um, I was reflecting that although water is symbolically cleansing, it's also very easily corrupted symbolically. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking of various examples floating into my mind. Um, you know, Abelin Moore's comic novel, Black Mischief, where in the kind of pretend northeastern African country of Azania, um, the French hotel keeper just goes out routinely and f fills up all the beachy water bottles with tap water. Um, and uh, uh, Norman Douglas's Fountains in the Sand about Tunisia, he describes some baths in it, Roman baths in a Tunisian town that um, he says, I, I just can't describe what they're like in the language of polite society. And says, why doesn't someone find an imam to corrupt to get to clean them up? Um, they, I actually visited them in the late eighties. They were still in the same state. Um, and uh, and um, um, Sybil Bedford in her travel book, A Visit to Don Otavio about, about Mexico, um, has a, actually a twist on that sort of theme where she, she, she and her, her traveling companion go to to visit some English expats and, uh, and who tell them that the, you can always trust the bottles of mineral water beside the bed in Mexican hotels. And they say, well, surely not. And the, the, the expats explain that in Mexico, um, 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 crime is a profession, that people are either honest or they're bandits. Um, so I, 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 was, I was wondering if you, that those fears entered into the material you're working on. And my second question is sort of related because it has to do with, my my sense that there ought to be quite a lot of jokes and laughter generated about around this culture, as indeed you, you showed at least one example of the the, uh, the caricature of Vichy and the the the, the local women and, and looking at the, the colonial soldiers. Um, one one reason would be that there often jokes often focus on instances where very diverse people are brought together. Mary Douglas says in Horacian jokes that if you if you have a, if you have a joke in which a lift breaks down and there's a bishop in it, whatever the bishop does will be funny because you'll be different from the other people. But the other is sort of the difference between high ideals and low reality. Um, Freud in um, somewhere writes about a patient of his who's cured, who experiences some degree of cure whenever he goes to Baden-Baden and um, the patient realizes the real reason is that he can carry on his 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 fling with with, with one of the I think with one of the chambermaids in his hotel, um, and and but he's delighted to kind of uphold the the, the scientific well the, the scientific uh, arguments provide a pleasant pretext for the for for the pleasurable reality. So um, well I. I hope I've managed to explain why I think the two questions are related. I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Before I try answering your excellent questions, um, what was that first reference about the Vichy waters being poured out and poured in? What, what was the, oh, the, the, the source? It, even in war, Black Mischief. Evelyn Waugh's Black Mischief, okay. Which um, I read years ago and, and obviously before I was interested in this topic because I didn't pick up on it. So thank you. Um, well, it's, an, it's a great question. And yes, you get a sense of the 
the humor, the grittiness, the, but to be honest, my sources don't always reflect this, right? I know that these people are, are having extramarital affairs with the person next to them because of some of things that, you know, a letter that I, that I find or something like that. But it's very rare to find a whole kind of irreverent, a humorous sketch of a spa town around a colonial theme, unfortunately. But I definitely get hints of this all the time. Um, these are places that induce terrible boredom in some of the curistes. And um, one of my sources is actually postcards home from the spas, which turned out to be a very expensive source to use because I had to go to the Marché de la Carte Postale in Paris and try to buy, or even eBay, and try to buy up hundreds of postcards that people sent home from Dolé les Bains, from Salazie. But some of them are very funny about the stink of sulfur, about the incredible boredom that they find, um, or about, you know, I'm returning here again to see whoever uh, with whom I clearly am having an affair on a regular basis once every four years when I go back to the Metropole because the two of us are on the same on the same rotational uh, cycle. So that is definitely alluded to in some of that more reverent postcard material that I've been able to, to uncover. Um, as for the kind of irony of these bottles themselves being, you know, these waters themselves being a vector of disease. Yes, I mean, uh, Salazi and Silaos get shut down for cholera epidemics. Um, I know from uh, work on Vichy that in the 19th century, epidemics break out there all the time. Um, and so there is this irony of you're bringing people, you're congregating them for uh, diseases, in some instances, social diseases such as tuberculosis, and surely you're going to have community spread. Um, so th that irony is definitely something that, that, that gets um, developed in some of my sources. Smollett's Humphrey Clinker comes to mind. His account of Bath is um, revolting beyond, scarily yeah. revolting and, and, and humorous beyond belief. Yeah. Because, but, but, but again, it's that incongruity between the high ideals and the low reality. Yes, and the, the dream, you know, the, the ideal on paper with all of these, these nice little grids and schemes and the reality of what really happens. There's also tragedy, right? Henri Donadieu, Marguerite Duras' father, dies on his return furlough to take the waters at Plombière, oh, yeah. um, leaving the family in misery, which is the starting point for the whole Marguerite Duras story, right? Um, the death of the father leads to the déclassement that she describes in all of her novels. Um, and and that, that death took place on furlough at Plombière because of his amoebic dysentery. Yeah, I must note that, that that's a really common theme in travel writing about, about Italy in the early 19th century. The people go there not so much for water, but for change of air, and they, they, they die. Yeah. yeah. No, that, what you said about postcards is, um, makes me see that they're, they're, they're an area I'd like, I'd like to investigate more, because postcards invite, they invite, they produce a sense of comedy because they, 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 put image and word next to each other and there's bound to be discrepancy between the two. There's a postcard, unfortunately I've never seen the image, but I but a postcard I really like by by Aldous Huxley, which is it's it, he sent it to, I think, to a nephew and it's of Buckingham Palace. And uh, on the back he says, here you can see the big queen on the balcony of of Buckingham Palace. I'm, I'm actually quite slightly wrong, but but um, in fact, it's just the Queen with her corgis. Or you know, it's kind of completely different image. Okay. She's just writing it quickly to kind of uh, communicate with a nephew. Um, and you often get that. I find when I've looked, when I've kind of picked up um, picked up postcards that I, I like buying secondhand postcards when I, I find them. That there's quite often that sort of discrepancy. People are kind of in their own their own sort of narcissistic world and the image is such showing something completely different. Um, Absolutely. But, but, uh, yeah. Absolutely. And, oh. and uh, the other, the other uh, point of intersection is that not only is France the empire of spas, but it's also the empire of postcards. I, I can't think of another nation that generated so many postcards in the era between 1880 and 1930 as France. So uh, they're, they're not just a rich source, they're a voluminous source, almost inexhaustible. God, a good excuse to go tootling around France once we can travel again. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That was really useful. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll definitely turn to some of those sources. Thanks. If there's time, if there's no more questions, can I ask a question or is, are you about to finish up? No, please. 
Um, hi, Alex Therese Francis, University of Amsterdam. Um, you may, thank, you, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning the role of classical culture uh, as being part uh, of this narrative of spas, and I could see how that would fit in with general conceptions of uh, French statehood and imperiality and kind of bolster that. Um, uh, but you didn't touch on it quite so much during the talk, although you did show us the image of Courbus in Tunisia. Yeah. And actually thinking about the discussion, I was thinking, you know, does that provide a different logic between self and other in general? The kind of the self other boundaries which we've been discussing, um, if the spa is of a classical location um, compared to uh, some of the other locations. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And to be honest, it's one that it's most easily addressed to the two North African examples of, of Algeria and Tunisia for obvious reasons, which is that that's what overlaps with the Roman Empire. Uh, and there you see a perfect illustration of what Patricia Lorsan argued in one of her arguments about the use of the Roman framework by the French in Algeria, which is to say it's used to elide um, the successive layers of Arab and Muslim presence. Mm -hmm. It is a way, it is a shortcut to go back to the ancients and to, to root the French presence directly into that of ancient Rome, thereby bypassing the Ottomans and, and all of that. Um, so it is a kind of shorthand. And I see that very potently articulated. So the guy- That's really fascinating. I happen to work on Romanian history in the 19th century. So I'm interested in this um, genealogies and narratives. You know. Yeah, so I, again, Patricia Lorsan, uh, L-O-R-C-I-N has an excellent, uh, yeah excellent short article on um, the ways in which the French deployed the Algerian uh, um, uh, metaphor, for lack of a better word. Sorry, the, the Latin metaphor, the Roman metaphor. Thanks. And more specifically in the spa, did the classical she themes doesn't from touch... North Africa, did they influence domestic spa architecture? Because we talked about Orientalist themes, but we yeah. didn't talk so much about classical themes. Yeah. They definitely, there's, there's a very clear classical theme in a lot of the spas that I discussed. Um, you might have picked up on the, the Réunion one, which talks about the temple to Hygieia. There's, there's a classical reference there. Um, the grander ones in the colonies definitely incorporate Doric columns. Um, you see the same thing happening at home. So Encos les Termes, which is a tiny little spa that catered to Algerian uh, uh, settlers. Uh, has these elaborate Roman columns on its on its uh, bathing establishment, even though it's not terribly big. Um, there's a, a real attempt to conjure up the the, the classical past. Mm -hmm. And I guess, as you said about Orientalism, we would have to distinguish between kind of generic classicism, yeah. which is all over the 19th century, and then specific. I think Precisely. the German context, context would be interesting to compare. I don't know if Oliver went, knows anything about classicism in Central European spa architecture. Or yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, um, this was especially connected to those places that had a Roman tradition of bathing. So Baden-Baden, uh, Wiesbaden, uh, baden New Vienna. So there was a kind of a archaeological interest in classical architecture. And that's why they put up uh, large um, classicist infrastructures. Um, so I think there's a connection between archaeology and bathing in, the, in those places. And of course, as uh, Professor Jennings said, this um, yeah, the narrative of uh, hygiene and, and and healthiness and cleanliness was connected to the middle uh, to the to the antiquity, not to the Middle Ages. Um, so I think this was yeah, it's it's kind of obvious. I think. Thanks so much, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And if there is no more question, I have a following up question. Uh, so you talked uh, about the pre. Um, historic practices from the local population. And when the French arrived uh, through medical discourses or through the architecture, they changed the image of the spa and they, they made it French somehow. And uh, I was wondering, because you also talked about the, the, the slavery past of certain uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, place. And I was wondering now that uh, the, the, the French empire uh, doesn't exist or with different, uh, different ways at least, uh, how, um, can you see these conflicting memories in the spa town? Uh, how do they deal with the colonial uh, uh, inheritance of, uh, of, yeah, of this? That's a weird question. Yeah, it's a good question and a complicated question because as I mentioned, a place like Elbourg-Salazie is 
plus beau village de France, quaintest village in France, and very proud of that title. And they portray themselves as Creole beauties. That's part of the slogan on, on the village, right? So the, the, the homes are all painted in pastel colors with you know, lace details and so on and so forth. So there's real pride in that colonial reference. Not to mention the inhabitants are, you know, of Réunion are so mixed that almost everybody has some black slave, Indian, Chinese ancestry. So it becomes very hard to disentangle the colonial moment of the spa from the rest of the story in a place like Réunion. What I will stress is that there is some work being done on medical practices of maroons. So uh, local historians in Réunion have worked, people like Prosper Eve, for instance, have done really interesting work on the grasses that the maroons were using. And the maroons were, were a real presence in Réunion because Réunion is so mountainous. I mean, I don't mean to, to remove agency from people, but it's just easier to hide in the mountains when there are mountains, right? So this, this is why Jamaica and Réunion uh, had a real uh, uh, maroon societies. And in Réunion, they were able to use a great many of the uh, grasses in the highlands to the point where some of those uh, uh, plants still have the maroon names associated with them. And linguists work on the Malagash root of the, the, the grass. So I have examples of slaves and maroons using the waters at Salazie prior to 1848 and the final abolition of slavery in the French colonies. And the question that I have is how you can reconcile that with the fact that around the same time, aristocrats are using those same waters, um, presumably at different times of the day. I don't know. And, and um, what's clear to me is that, you know, the question of slavery is omnipresent in, in these old French colonies, and it can't be disentangled from the waters just as it can't be disentangled from anything else. And in the case of Algeria and Tunisia, especially Algeria with the... the, the... You know, That's a very good question, and I haven't been to uh, to Algeria, so I can't answer it. Um, these, you know, there's there's different reactions to the colonial past in Algeria. Um, there isn't, for instance, much by way of vineyards left after 1962, even though Algeria had been what the world's fourth largest wine producer until then. Um, so that was a complete tearing up of the colonial past. The spas continue to be used. The question is, what did they do with the colonial uses? Um, and I just don't have the answer to that. In Madagascar, they are widely used. I mean, it is unbelievable how popular the spa at Antirabe is. I stayed there, I stayed in Antirabe for 10 days. And what I experienced on the weekend was all of the cities emptied and their inhabitants were going to take the waters at Antirabe. Um, so uh, I, I really was able, I mean, if I were an anthropologist or I had a better journalistic flair, I would have written a piece on that. And, and as for hill stations, the, the most astonishing one of all, because I worked on Dalat, but Bana was a minor French colonial hill station in Indochina, where the French had tried to create a miniature clone of France on a very modest scale with some local villas and pavillons and so on. Well, to my astonishment in the last 10 years, um, Vietnamese entrepreneurs have set up a kind of Euro Disney in Bana. You have to climb the mountain to get to it. And what is it but a replica of France with a church, a castle. And so here you have the colonized putting on display their former colonizers in a very bizarre uh, um, um, display. That's fascinating. So, yeah, Bana is definitely a place to visit if you get a chance. B-A uh, dash N-A or sometimes no dash depending on the, depending on the spelling. Thank you. Do we have more questions? I see a lot of people had to leave already. <laughs> so, no more questions? Okay, then I think we can uh, thank again, uh, Eric Jenny. Thank, thank you. you very much. I read your book and I was really looking forward to your lecture. So, thank you very much. It was uh, very fascinating. And to uh, Martin for your comments and good luck for uh, finishing your PhD. And I see you around soon, I guess, in Leuven. Uh, so thank you, uh, all of you. And uh, yeah, uh, when is the last, the next uh, seminar? Do you know, Enrique? Or... It's on the fourth of June. Fourth of June. So you all welcome to uh, join us for the the third uh, seminar of our series. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone, for your kind words and and your uh, your thoughtful questions. Don't hesitate to email me if you want to continue the dialogue. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.